If you got your Bible with you, turn to Matthew chapter 3. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 3. I want to share some scripture with you. Teach a little bit, preach, and then get you out of here. Look at your neighbor and say, are you ready? Look at your other neighbor and say, you better be. Verse 13, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River. He wanted to be baptized by John, but John tried to stop him. So he told Jesus, I need to be baptized by you. How, how often do we think we know better than Jesus? <laughs> no, hang on, Jesus. Let me just tell you how it needs to be. Hold up. Hold up, Jesus. I, you need to do. Yeah. He says, I need to be baptized by you. So why do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be this way for now. It is right for us to do this. It carries out God's holy plan. Then John agreed, and as soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. Listen to this. Jesus saw the Spirit of God coming down on him like a dove. A voice from heaven said, this is my son. I love him, and I'm very pleased with him. Jesus goes into the water with, with John. John baptizes him as he comes up out of the water, the Spirit of God ascends upon him out of heaven. And a voice from heaven, being God's voice, says, that's my son. I love him. And I'm very pleased with him. Before Jesus ever did anything in ministry, before Jesus performed any miracles, before he preached any sermons, right? Before water ever became wine, right? Before healings ever took place, before, before he raised the dead, before he healed the blind, before whatever it was, this was before that. And God said, that's my son. I want you to notice something. He gave him an identity first. He was telling him who he was first. That's my son. And I love him. And I'm very pleased with him. I'm pleased with him before he does anything I've asked him to do. Anybody got kids in the room? How many have Mac Rye? Look. But you love them anyway, right? And the love never changes no matter how bad they act or how good they act. You still love them the same. Well, some of you are like, I don't know. It just depends on the day. But that, God was saying, I, I love him. And, and I really think there, there's so much in this scripture for us to see. I was trying to think of a story I could share to lead into it. And finally, the Lord just said, man, why don't you just share my story? Why don't you just share my story? Sometimes we as preachers think we got to add to the story. No, we don't. You saw what happened about five minutes ago, right? That's all Jesus. We don't have to add to anything. He just transforms people's lives. If we just share his story, so that's what I want to do. I want to share his story today. He comes up out of the water. and God's like, I love you, son. And I'm pleased with you. Now, guess what? Let's read chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the who? The Spirit into where? Wilderness. He was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted by who? The devil. The devil. You can pull that down. So, okay, God, you love me and you're pleased with me and I'm your son. And now you're going to send me into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Why? 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 Why are you, if you love me, God, why would you put me in the wilderness? God, wilderness being the desert place, right? A place of loneliness, right? That, that's the, how many of us have been lonely? How many of us feel like we're in the wilderness today? Let's just get real. Can we get raw and real in the room? How many of us feel like we're in a wilderness moment right now? Jesus went straight from the water moment, the miracle moment, into the wilderness moment. Why? God, I thought you loved me. God, I, I thought I, thought I was, I was going to serve you. Why are you going to send me into the... Why do, I, why do I need to be... Why do you need to take me away from everything that I know? Why do, you, why do I have to feel like nobody's for me, God? Why do I have to feel this way? How many of us have felt that way? How many of us have gotten mad at God for the wilderness situation we're in today? The Spirit of God led him into the wilderness. Some of you are begging God to get out of the very place God has sent you to. I get it. I've been there. 
Why, why, God, why would I be in this place? Why would, why would this have to be happening to me? Why would I be going through this? Why, God, I thought you loved me, God. I thought you were pleased. Wait, I must not be doing enough for you. Let me do a little bit more. Whoa, stop. It's not about what you do. It's about who he is in you. And we've got to stop trying to get out of the very situations God has led us into so that we can get ready for where God's taking us to. That, that, that's, what, that's really what it's about. Here's what I want you to know. The wilderness, it's a place of purpose. Everybody say purpose. purpose. Your wilderness is a place of purpose. In other words, there's a reason you're there. And some of you's like, yeah, I probably got myself here. Some of you did get yourself there. Have you ever been to a wilderness that you walked into and God didn't send you? He'll still use it for His own purpose. So no matter the wilderness you're in today, no matter whether you caused it or somebody else caused it or the Spirit of God led you into it, there's purpose behind it. But I don't want to be here. I doubt Jesus wanted to be there either. The Spirit of God ascended on Him. I'm going to repeat myself a few times today. I want you to get this. Ascended upon Him. The voice of God said, Son, I love you. You're my Son. I'm pleased with you. Now go get tested. Verse 2. Chapter 4, verse 2. Pull that up. To be tested by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was what? Hungry. Let's go ahead and read next verse. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. I want you to, I want you to notice something about verse 2 and verse 3. After 40 days of fasting, he was what? hungry. He was led into the wilderness by the Spirit of God to be tempted by the devil, right? Why did he wait 40 days? He was vulnerable. Well, he's, he's been in here all three services. He's answering all my questions. <laughs> Praise Jesus. He was vulnerable. You know something else about the devil? He's a snake, right? He's Genesis, the beginning of Genesis and the beginning of time, Adam and Eve, he was a snake, right? You know something about snakes? They don't have eyelids. They don't blink. In other words, he's watching you. And he watched Jesus for 40 days before he said a word. Before he said anything. He watched him. He probably watched him pray. He probably watched him worship. He probably watched him gripe and moan. Because I got a feeling Jesus was probably gripe. He probably, when he got hungry, he probably said, God, why? I mean, I get that he was perfect and all, but you know. But he watched him for 40 days, day and night, night and day. He watched him. Funny thing about that is he's watching you too. He's a snake. He sized him up for 40 days. Sized him up. You know something about snakes? They're dangerous. You ever heard the story of the lady that owned the python? Oh. Anybody own a python in this room? No. Nobody? There was two people in here that raised their hand in the second service, and I thought, oh, my goodness. Lady on the python was sick, hadn't been eaten. You know what that means when snakes don't eat, right? She took it to the vet, and she said, something's wrong with my, with my python. Something's wrong with my snake. I, He's not eating. It's been two or three weeks. He won't eat. Like, he's my, I know, I know him. He's my pet. I know him. Like, I sleep with this pet. That's, is that not nasty? Yes. Yeah. The ladies in the second service said they slept with the pet. I said, what is wrong with you? We sent altar team over to him right then in the middle of service. We started praying. So the, the veterinarian said, look, do you sleep with him? She said, yeah. Does he curl up around you? Like this gives me like the heebie-jeebies, right? If y'all even know what that is, heebie-jeebies. But she said he used to curl up around me, curl around my legs, and, and he would, I would sleep, and it, would, it was just comfort. And now he, he doesn't curl up around me. He just, he just lays straight up beside me. And he said, well, I got some good news and some bad news. He's not sick. He's sizing you up. Your snake's getting ready to eat you. It's the same thing the devil does to us. He's sizing you up. He's 
He's watching you. He, he, he doesn't stop watching you. He waited 40 days. He watched Jesus get weak. He will test you in different areas. In one area, he tests you is in your weakness. He knows your weakness. You know that, right? The enemy knows your weakness. If you don't know that, hear it. He knows your weakness. If you struggle with alcohol, he knows it. If you struggle with anger, he knows it. If you struggle with gossip, he knows it. If you struggle with depression, he knows it. He knows what you struggle with. He knows your weakness and he comes at your weakness. He said, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread and have a meal because you hadn't eaten in 40 days. I know you're hungry, Jesus. Let's go. I got your food. It's testing. Wilderness is also a place of testing. There's tests. He goes on to say this. Jesus, Jesus said, no. The scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, the word of God is what feeds us. The word of God is what feeds our, our, our spiritual soul. It, it feeds us. Then the devil took him to, a holy, to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will, he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you don't even hurt your foot on a stone. His weakness and his identity. Are you hungry? And if you are the son of God, if you are a child of God, why do you still have the thoughts you have? If you are a child of God, why do you still do the things you did last night? You may be in church today, but you're not a true son of God. I mean, look at what you were doing last night. Look at the thoughts you had on the way. Look at how you talk to your kids and how you talk to... If you were a son of God, you would have stopped all that stuff. Does this sound familiar? See, he'll test you in your weakness, but he'll also test you in your identity. If you truly are a son or a daughter, you wouldn't act like that. You wouldn't talk like that. You wouldn't think like that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't live your life the way you're living. Just because you go to church doesn't mean anything. Just because you prayed a prayer, for those of you that just prayed that prayer, just because you said a prayer. No, you didn't just say a prayer. You meant something in your heart, and you believed it in your heart, and you confessed it with your mouth. But he'll, he'll test you in your identity. He goes on to say this. He says, next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and, the glory, and their glory. He said, I'll give it all to you, he said, if you'll just kneel down and worship me. Verse 10, get out of here, Satan. That's what Jesus said. Everybody say, get out. out. See, so you're going to have to learn how to say get out, right? And you can't just be like, oh, get out. Go away. I'm tired of you. No, you got to say, get out. Well, however, you got to stand your ground and say, devil, get out. Devil, I'm tired of you being in the midst of my life. Get out. Devil, I know who I am. Get out. I'm a child of the most high God. Get out. I'm a conqueror. Get out. I'm more than a conqueror. Get out. Right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Get out. Get out. Say it with me. Get out. Get out. Some of you need to be saying get out today. Because he's testing you. And he's tempting you. Tell Jesus, I'll give you everything. He'll tempt you and test you in your desires. With money. He'll show you things you've never seen before in the world because that's what you're focused on. And if you don't catch it, you'll be so focused on what you want, you'll miss what God has. Because it's what you desire. He will test and tempt you through the desires of your heart. Isn't that crazy? Your weaknesses, your identity in Christ, who you are. Now he's going he's gonna to literally tempt and test you in the areas of things that you want. So your desires have to line up with God's desires. He's a snake, and he's coming after you. Verse 11 says, Then the devil went away, and the angels came and took care of Jesus. See, that is also a place of preparation. Everybody say preparation. preparation. So you've got a purpose, 
place of purpose, a, a place of testing, and now it's a place of preparation. What, what's the reason behind testing in school? To learn, to know, but you take a test before you what? Before you pass, before you move on to the next thing. Right? You, if you don't pass your exams, you don't move on to the next grade. Right? If you don't pass your algebra test, you don't move on to geometry. So a test, there's a purpose in that testing, and that's preparing you for what's next. In other words, your wilderness situation is all preparation for where God wants to take you. It's preparation. It's preparing you. Because what God has is so much bigger than you. See, we, we, what we want is we want these water moments, right? The baptism, and then we want to skip the wilderness and get right to the promise. The problem is you can't handle the promise yet Amen. because you aren't ready. But you, you want that miracle moment, right? I mean, how many of us enjoyed worship this morning? I mean, to a point of just, wow, what is going on in this room? God is transforming lives right in this. We want to go from that moment to the promise of God. The problem is we're not ready for it because we haven't been tested. Because what God has for you is so much bigger than what you can imagine. What God has next for you. Some of us don't even know how to think that way. What do you mean God's got something bigger than me? What his plan for you is bigger than you. It's bigger than where you're at today. It's got more to do with him, not you. That's really what that means. You know it, right? His plan has more to do with him than you. And when you get to know that, you have to go through tests to realize that, that that's what it's about. Here's, here's how we do, do life. Yes, I brought water. I like water. Everybody keeps laughing because every time I come, I got water. This is, this, this is going to represent our faith walk, right? Our faith. And so we come to church with this tank that represents our water moments. Everybody say water moment. You got water moment to wilderness. Jesus went from the water to what? The wilderness. And I'll tell you where he went next here in just a minute. But what we do is we come in on Sunday and we, we come into to our water moments and worship is just on fire, right? Like we're dancing, like literally, if you watched, I was up here dancing. I can't dance, but I can dance in the spirit. Is that okay? I call it in the spirit because that makes it okay. No matter how bad it is, it's in the spirit. You can't laugh about it. Stop laughing. So we, 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 we get our worship on and we get filled up, right? Like we feel good. How many of us came out of that worship just feeling good? Like we feel good, we're, re we're ready for the week, ain't we? How many is ready for the week? See, what we do is this, is this is our water moment. And at times our water moments end because we got to leave church and we get to the parking lot and somebody cuts us off and we're a little emptier now. So there we are, walking through Sunday afternoon. We go to eat, and the waitress is not very Christian-like. And then we don't act very Christian-like. Anybody else been there? Yeah, time or two. And so we start walking, and we get tested. And the enemy comes at us like a knife and just begins to cut. Then we get home and we get in an argument with our wife or our husband and we say things we don't need to say and the enemy cuts again. You're not the husband God says you are. There ain't nothing Christian about you. Hey, let me tell you what I can offer you. I, it'll feel better if you'll go ahead and do that. And we start taking these shots. Before you know it, we're leaking. Anybody else know you leak? And we're taking all this on. And then we get to Monday, Tuesday, and the enemy comes a little bit harder. Let me see this one. We've done pretty good this week. Now it comes at our kids. I mean, seriously, think about that. You think he don't use your kids? You think he don't use you and your kids? And he comes at, at, at your kids, they're going through a situation, they don't handle it right, and he says, you didn't raise them in the Word of God. What kind of Christian are you? And 
Isn't that what happens? Now you're in the wilderness and you're empty. Because you left the water moment expecting to move into the promise, not realizing what the wilderness was about to bring you. Now I'm empty. And I'm waiting for Sunday because I ain't been to prayer this week. I hadn't opened my word this week. Prayed on Monday. Read a couple of scriptures on Tuesday. And man, I just, I just, I don't even know if God hears me anymore. I can't hear him. If I can't hear him, what, what's the point? I must not be doing things right. If I'm not doing things right and he don't love me anymore, and am I really his son? Are you, are you hearing where I'm going with this? Isn't this what we do? Because then we begin to create stories in our own mind about God and how God feels about us. Do not get confused how God feels about you. God loves you. You're his son and he's well pleased with you. No matter what you're going through or no matter what the wilderness is, you might be empty today. He still loves you. You may be far from him spiritually. He loves you. You don't have to do anything for him to be pleased with you. He may not be pleased with your actions, but he's pleased with who you are because he created you. And we're empty. And what do we do? Man, I got to get back to church. I got to get back to church. Here's the problem. If all I do is get back to church, See, I, I think, I think we live sometimes in water moments and we try to go from one moment to the next and we don't fully live in him. You see, there's a difference in living in him and with him. Are you hearing me? There's a difference in walking life out in him and walking beside him. There's a difference in that. There's something deeper to this relationship. There's something deeper to what he has for you. And when you go through the wilderness, you need to be in him, not just with him. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If we can ever understand, this is him, by the way. If I live in him, and I come and get filled up, Worship's good. Pastor Jamie's preaching good. Nobody ticked me off in the parking lot good. Me and my wife didn't argue today good. Now I'm in him. I spend time with him. I pray, I talk to him. I worship him. I ask his opinion of what I'm doing tomorrow. I ask his opinion of what I'm doing today. I'm not just walking with, beside him because I got a little bit of insurance on my eternal life. I'm walking in him because I've gone all in with him. And when I go all in with him, look, devil. Hang on. Hang on. Why can't he take the same shot he used to? Because I know who I am. I'm his. Can he get to me? Yeah. But can he have me? No. Doesn't matter how big the hole gets. I'm still in him. Doesn't matter how jacked up I get. Doesn't matter if my life goes sideways. Because when hell hits home, life gets sideways, don't it? How many of you, wilderness seems like sideways life? And when it goes sideways, look, I'm, I'm still in him. I fully believe if we could ever begin to walk in him and not beside him, wilderness life would not be near as bad as it is. And we wouldn't be begging to get out of it. We would be praising God through it. We would know that God's got something bigger on the other side. Let, let me show you what I mean by that. There's purpose in it. Listen to this. Luke chapter 4. 
Now I'm jumping to Luke because in Matthew, it, it literally goes from, from chapter 4 and it talks about him going into ministry and preaching. In Luke, it comes right out of the baptism, right out of the wilderness, and it says, Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Hang on. Filled with the Holy Spirit's power. This is Luke chapter 4, verses 14. Filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Filled with the power that gets you through the wilderness. Filled with the power that takes you through the struggles. Filled with the power to, to help you realize you can't do it on your own. You can only do it through Him. Why? Because you live in Him. Amen. See, it's the Holy Spirit's power that guides us and leads us. It's not our own. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to have this, this life of a, of a Christian at church. And, and we do our thing. We serve a little bit. We're, we're there. We're, we're living in and out of the water moment. We're doing our thing. But the problem is you don't ever have to leave Him. You dwell in him. What's that mean? It means you do nothing without him. It doesn't mean you spend 24 hours a day in constant communication, but here's what it does mean. You have a constant relationship with him. I was in Florida for three days doing, doing meetings with Compassion Network this week, and me and my wife never go places without each other. We don't. We literally, this was a very rare occasion, and we don't do it. I, I couldn't go hours without talking to her. I know that may sound weird. Y'all may call me whipped, call it whatever you want, but I love my wife. But I don't want to go hours without talking to her. If it's not a conversation, it's text. If it's not text, it's, it's FaceTime, right? Like literally, we're, we're in communication all the time, and I know where she's at and what she's doing. Heck, I even got, what is that, Life360? Y'all got that? I got my eye on her all the time. But I, I do that, why? Because I'm in relationship with her. We're one, which means we're together all the time. We're doing everything we do together, even if we're not in the same room. It's the same thing. I'm, I'm in him. And everything I do is led and, and led and guided by him, but it's also for him. And yes, I make mistakes, and yes, I mess up, and yes, the enemy gets at me at times, but he can't have me. Why? Because I live in him. Stop trying to get out of the very wilderness that's trying to test you to get you ready for the promise. It don't make sense. There's situations we're in right now with, 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 that, with my, me and my wife and our family, and it doesn't make sense, and it's wilderness, and it's like, God, where are you at? But I have to trust him in this. I have to trust that he's going to do something in here, and he's going to make everything come together in a way I don't even see right now because there's something far bigger than me over here. And if I don't go through that wilderness, I'm not strong enough to handle what he has. Stop trying to get out of it and walk in him through it. Listen, listen to the scripture. I love this. He returned with the Holy Spirit's power. Listen, when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place. He found what? He found the place. He didn't just go to share anything. He found the place. He found the place where this, this one thing was written. Specific. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has anointed me through my wilderness moments Amen. to bring. He has anointed me through the hardship of what I just dealt with to bring good news to the poor. He has anointed me. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released. In other words, He sent me to set the bondages free, the captives free. Through my wilderness experience, he gave me the strength and he got me ready to anoint me to give this word. That the blind will see, the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. God has a purpose for everything the water, the wilderness. The promise, the water, the baptism, who you are, who he says you are, how much he loves you, the wilderness, the testing, who you are, who he says you are. 
the promise. If we'll ever grasp that and realize it's all about him and not about us, we'll see more promises than we can imagine. But you will go through wilderness moments that you have to be ready for. They're there to test you and prepare you for what's coming next. God's got a plan for everybody in this room. And hear me when I say this. It's bigger than you. His plan and purpose is bigger than me. Say his purpose purpose. is bigger than me. It's bigger than you. Bow your heads and close your eyes just for a minute. Worship team's going to come back out and the prayer team's going to come forward right now. You can go ahead and do that. Maybe you're in here today and you're in a wilderness moment. You don't understand it. You don't know why. You're frustrated. But you've been trying to live this water-to-water moment. And it's not working. But you're in a moment right now, you're in a time right now that you know you've got to go all in with Jesus and you've got to walk in Him. So you've got to worship in the wilderness. You've got to pray in the wilderness. You've got to communicate with God in the wilderness. You can't shut down. You've got to keep going. You've got to go through the wilderness. If you ever stop moving, you won't make it. You've got to go. And, and some of you have stopped. Some of you shut down. And right now, it's in this moment that you've got to decide to keep going so that you can see the promise. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in here and you'd say, I'm in a wilderness moment, just raise your hand. I'm in the wilderness. Yeah, raise them up high all across the room. I'm going through the wilderness. Hear me. There's purpose in it. And if you'll allow God to show you what he needs to show you, you'll see the promise. If you'll walk through these tests and whatever you're dealing with right now, walk through them in him. And allow him to have his hand upon you every day, every minute of every day. You'll come through the wilderness and you'll see all that he's got for you. I'm going to say a prayer and here's what I'm going to invite you to do. If you raise your hand, I want you to come to this altar and just ask for prayer. Let us pray and agree with you about where God's taking you, what God has for you. Maybe you're just struggling with even letting go of it all and you're angry at God. That's okay. He already knows. Just just come and pray. God, give us boldness today to just step out and walk through the wilderness to understand that there's purpose in it. And God, you've got something much bigger than us on the other side. God, help us to walk in you. Walk in you. Dwell in you. Spend time with you. Get to know you. Know who you are. God, have your way in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen.